to learn from Pamela's extensive experience in Africa and to celebrate the publication of her newest book, Give a Spoon Over Lagos. My name is Andrew Desette and I am the Corporate Affairs Manager of Exploration Senegal and Myanmar here at Woodside. Uh, but in a place like Lagos, you, 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 you will start off with your to-do list and inevitably with the way in which things would happen, you were lucky if one thing was actually accomplished. And that was something that took a while for me to, to, to realise. But equally, in each day, uh, dealing with things like changing personnel and then, you know, in a small business, that's quite devastating when somebody leaves. Um, trying to do something social for the community uh, and give them the 13 month salary or the Christmas feast. And, and then the fraud and the impact of something like that has on the trust, even in a very small team. So it was illustrating all those different things which I was juggling in, in running um, a business in, in a challenging environment. You also got an amazing story filled with adventures and experience that most of us uh, can only dream about. Uh, I imagine there have been a number of sacrifices and challenges uh, along the way, a number of which you describe in the book, but I'm sure many more. Can you share some of those with us? Sacrifices. <laughs> I think sacrifices are always made because there's rewards. It's, it's a bit of a balance. Um, I think, I think uh, the thing that I encountered on my bicycle ride, uh, which really stunned me, um, also occurred when I was on my own in, in Lagos, despite the fact I was in a city of 20 million and with two businesses and all this activity. And that was loneliness. Um, that sense of being alone with a challenge and, and you know, not necessarily having, having a really strong partner you know, who was there with you. But uh, on my bicycle ride, it, was, it came as a big surprise because I was a very experienced traveller and I'd never never felt lonely. Um, but being on a bicycle out in the villages of Africa where people were being extraordinarily generous um, in helping me, providing me shelter at night, and I was really humbled by their generosity. But we had very little in common. And particularly at the beginning, it felt like they were looking at me like I was an alien, and I came to see myself and other white people that way deeper into the journey. Um, but, you know, there was that chasm of, of the conversations being about where I was from, you know, was I married, how many children did I have, and it was repeated. And, and when I got sick and I was in a very remote place, that was when the loneliness really took hold. So it's when you're down, you're, your defences are down. And, and that's one of the things I found in Lagos as well, that, you know, when things started to go wrong, it was like, who do you turn to? And it's very hard for people to really understand exactly what you're going through. Uh, you know, I don't know about the sacrifices because what happens is that people step up and, and enter your life and it's not necessarily the people that you expect. And I've got, you know, I had some marvellous mentors in Lagos who stepped up uh, when, when, you know, I had problems. Thank you for that. Jess, you've travelled a long way to be in Perth as well. Can I ask you to elaborate on your experiences about balancing your career to be successful um, to get you to this point today? Yes, thanks Andrew. Um, hello everyone. And so, I reflect when you're talking about loneliness and one of the key sacrifices I made to make sure I progress my career in the way I want along with my values was to leave my country. And that's just not an easy decision to make because you're stepping out of your support network. You're stepping out even not having the right finances, you know, like that lady you talked about in, your cha in the chapter. She's stepping out potentially. She's taking money from you. I'm just mm -hmm. interpreting. Mm -hmm. and because I have been in that situation where, you know, you were stepping out, went to the UK to study. I was lucky to have a scholarship that enabled me to do that. But otherwise, it would have been very difficult. And even with that support, I was on beans and toast with my seven-year-old and husband for a quite a long time until I finished my studies. So yes, and, you know, and why did I leave is because I, at the time, it was a 2003 um, um, strike, oil strike in Venezuela, 
the, the oil and gas company um, had been basically politicized completely, and if you were not with the party, and you were not corrupt, you would not get anywhere. And I just completely misaligned with my values, and you know, that's why I left. Thanks, Jess, for that candid response. And it plays into my next question for you, Pamela. Lagos is a city which is often described as, as being corrupt and having corrupt practices. But rather than reflecting on the negatives, can you talk to, I guess, what surprised you most about the city and what you loved the most about Lagos over your period of time there? I mean, I think, I think you're, you're right to part corruption because it's a big subject. Um, but it, it's actually something which Nigerians want to tackle and is being tackled. And so, you know, I, I could talk at length tonight about how, how it can be approached. But I think you're right, this, you know, the positives. This place is so dynamic. Um, it's the, the energy of Nigerians, and there's Nigerians in the room here, Nigerian Australians, um, is extraordinary. When, when you arrive into Lagos at, at the Metal and the Hamid International Airport, uh, you know, people are greeting each other, not having seen each other for a while. There, there's a real f um, energy furnace inside Nigerians which translates into ambition, personal ambition and ambition for their country. It translates into a hunger for learning, um, for uh, education, and um, they're very gregarious. Uh, you know, they, they have a lot of fun. And, and so in that environment, you, you, know, you are drawn out of yourself to um, work hard and, and, and have a lot of fun. And I think the other aspect is that it is very challenging and life is a roller coaster. And it's not just for me as a stranger, it's a roller coaster for, for Nigerians as well. And so every day you're having to draw on reserves to be adaptable, to be resilient, to, to cope. And as I said earlier, you know, any day is probably not going to turn out the way in which you anticipate it. And for me, that's the essence of adventure. So when I was on my bicycle ride, I didn't know where I was going to be staying at night. And in Lagos, I just didn't know, you know whether perhaps there was not going to be any fuel available and I wouldn't be able to get to work. Um, you know, there could just so many ways in which things could go wrong. But, but that adds a real excitement to life. Your, your book is also a, a business management type book as well. Uh, in relation to your social enterprise that you set up in Lagos, can you provide advice to, to the, the members in the room here around what it takes to step into a role in an industry you're not completely familiar with uh, or you don't know everything about uh, immediately um, with regards to your social enterprise business? It's not that different from um, any business. I think in a challenging environment, the key thing is taking time and developing a very robust plan. And, you know, I'm a strategy consultant, so I probably would say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I did my bicycle ride, I spent six months in London, uh, had quit my job uh, before I, I hopped on a plane and went to, went to Africa. And to me, that was the reason I was successful. And I think uh, if, if you're setting up in a, a, a new industry or a new country, you really need to invest in that time to, to learn. And in a place like Nigeria or West Africa, if you're going there, then you're not just learning about the industry. Um, my social enterprise had as employees the, the underprivileged, the, le the less educated um, part of society. I was used to dealing with boards um, and at very senior management levels. So I was having to be stretched to think about how do I train these people and uh, wanting to create non-hierarchical, uh, you know, uh, leaderful culture in my social enterprise. And I could not get these people to call me Pamela. I, I was always madam. Uh, and, and so there were these, you know, granular level details with, which um, I hadn't anticipated in my plan. Um, so you'll always end up learning things along the way, but taking that time to really um, learn about the, the, the culture of the people that you're going to work with, um, their skills, 
um, and, and incorporating that within your plan. You, you, in an environment like that, you're always going to end up needing deeper pockets and more time than you could possibly anticipate. In order. Thank you. Sarah, your role at Woodside maybe didn't exist 10 or uh, 20 years ago, so in many respects a new role in the company. How, what advice would you give to staff members stepping into a new role and uh, taking on a new challenge such as what you've done? Thanks, Andrew. Look, I might um, just share a little bit about what I do. Um, and for me, it's about self-awareness because I've got lots of strengths and I've got lots of weaknesses and some days my weaknesses take over my strengths and other days they don't. So. On a daily basis, I'm continually trying to self-assess and be the best version of me. I guess one of the things that Pamela just talked about there, over the last five years, I've been privileged enough to be involved in an organisation um, from a business school I went to a few years ago, and we are a group of 40 people from 22 nations around the world, and ranging from an industrial mushroom farmer in the Netherlands to a fine arts supplier out of um, the United States and in Morocco, one of the um, big success stories of um, electronic payment that's been set up for 20 to 30 years. And what I've learned by being involved in that is the power of different cultures and understanding how different cultures work and how, um, how I'm viewed by different cultures and um, my Australianness and the impact that has but also doing business in different nations around the world. And we have a group where we're constantly sharing both our business challenges, but also our challenges around the world. When things are happening, it really humanises events that are happening around the world. Um, we've been sharing a lot with coronavirus and what's happening in people's organisations from Europe to Africa to the US and South America. and. That has had a huge impact on me, Andrew, because it's actually helped me understand how we within Woodside and we within Perth and Australia fit in the greater, the greater world and, and also in understanding how to better work with those that we come across in our international operations. Thank you for that. Pamela, can you, you've been work, you worked in West Africa for, for many years. Can you describe what evolved uh, over the period of time from when you first arrived in West Africa to when you left at the end of 2009 uh, and maybe just outline some of the changes you observed along the way. I was first in, in West Africa, of course on my bicycle ride, so this was 92 to 94. Uh, I didn't go to West Africa when I first went down the Nile, which was when the Cold War was still on and most countries were Marxist. But 92 to 94, when I went to West Africa, uh, was pivotal in change happening. It was the introduction of democracy. And uh, in every country that I cycled through, they were either having their constitutional conference or were just before, during, or after their first election in the new democratic era, following um, having um, military rulers or Marxist um, uh, governments in place. And um, as a consequence during that period, there was very little private sector. It was just starting to develop. And in fact, my work had taken me to East Africa in privatisation. Um, before I set off on that bike ride, and a lot of that was happening. I was in Nigeria on June 12, 93, which um, for the Nigerians in the room, that's an important day. Uh, that, that was their first election, and I, I was still in Nigeria when um, Babangida, the head of state, annulled the election and sent everybody into um, despair. Very tense time, not knowing what was going to happen. Um, and so there was this whole mystery of what was, it, it was a combination of hope that change was coming and that democracy was going to bring a better, better life and despair because unfortunately the democratisation process was quite rushed and, and so a lot of the vested interests really held on to power. So in many countries, the 90s were a lot lost decade and Nigeria was a case in point. So then I arrived in Nigeria in 99 
um, which was the year when they finally transitioned to, to their first um, uh, democratic leader in, uh, and, and parliament under the, the new uh, rules. And um, on arriving in 99, there were 10,000 phone lines in the country. And to get a message to somebody, you had to send a driver with a note. And the traffic is appalling. And so you'd be sending notes with your driver just to tell them that you were delayed because of some <laughs> other problem that you'd had. But you couldn't use these 10,000 phone lines because they were so congested. I mean, this is a country um, then it was probably 150 million, it's nearly 200 million people. And the, the phone lines in the old system, somebody would go to the telco and pay a bit of dash to get the line pulled from somebody else's connections, put into <laughs> your connections so you can make a phone call. All that changed in about 2001-2002 and I mean, you all know about the telecoms revolution in Africa but to, to live through it was absolutely incredible. It was so fast that um, MTN, Econet came, came into Lagos and uh, yeah, it was quite expensive and so you know, these companies are trying to predict how many phone lines are going to be picked up of this, this uh, mobile. And within six months, all their predictions have been out, you know, outdone many times over. And, and privileged people like me, I've been buying phones and SIM cards and plans for my driver, for my cook, for my staff. Um, and everybody across the country was doing it. Somebody who was a welder, who was a tailor, they were buying mobile phones and suddenly they could be talking to their customer or you know, saying, I'm going to be late with the delivery. And it just, it opened up possibilities of more work very quickly. And that was a, a, a big fill up. It also created a lot of uh, professional jobs, whereas the professional jobs had all been really in the oil and gas industry in, in Nigeria. Suddenly, uh, the telecommunications companies and, and the banks were growing as well. Um, offered a route for graduates to really get good jobs. So suddenly you had a middle class emerging. And then the middle class are wanting all the nice goodies that, that we like. And so uh, shops are opening. And, and so the difference in that first 10 years was enormous, the first decade of the millennium. Um, and there was a lot of optimism and the diaspora was coming back because they were seeing opportunities, particularly after the GFC, because um, jobs were being lost in, in Europe and so the, the diaspora was coming back. Um, but right through that period, there's you know two steps forward, one step back, there's things going on. And basically the second decade of the millennium, in a way I've been disappointed at the fact that power, which was the next transforming uh, change that, that really would have given a kickstart to the industry, it just hasn't happened, in, not, not, in, not um, in, in the way in which we'd anticipated. And policies, you know, different governments have different ideas about how to open up their countries and how important it is to protect. So I think the story, it's more of the same. It's always that you expect a bit more, but the trajectory has been, been good. And uh, there's now, a, an exodus of people to the cities. I think that that experience of the first decade taught Africans that the cities are where you can get jobs and where you can, you know, instead of carrying water on your head, that you might actually be able to get a job and earn an income without it being always physically hard. And and so you you know, a place like Lagos is just massively growing, and and so you know, there's honestly a revolution happening in Africa with that movement in. And with that, and the young people who are much better educated, and with the entrenched um, 4G and coming 5G systems, then tech-enabled businesses are taking off. And every time I visit Lagos now, it's just new businesses. And that was one of the things I loved about the place, was that you felt there was so much opportunity. And in a place like Australia or the UK, you're scratching your head, you know, you think of an idea and then you realise it's already done. 
in Lagos and in Africa generally, there's just so many things that need to be done and you can make a business out of it. And right now that is happening with the young people. They need help, but it's 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 really going through quite a quite a big transformation. Thank you for that. Fast forward another ten years and this question is for you, Jess. Uh, how is Woodside now operating uh, in West Africa? Um, and are there any changes you've observed uh, in our time over the last few years? Thanks. Um, I can relate to some of the points you made in terms of the growth that's happened in the region, and it's, it's basically, it has been a population boom. You know, there's a lot of young people across Africa, and they're all thirsty for power, because power is linked to education, and education is the key to development across the region. And, uh, pretty much every event that we attend globally, the discussion about Africa is how do we power Africa? And how can the governments can organize themselves to really empower and um, put the systems in place for us to do some business there? <laughs> I don't think there is a work-life balance. I think if, if uh, you know, you've got a big challenge, if you're you know, starting a business, it's consuming, and, and I've always done that. I started off as a yuppie in, in the UK, and that was working weekends, working 24 hours, uh, and it was a period of my career when I was expected to do that, and I was voracious and learning, and I was exposed to many different clients and many different industries, and I, you know, I, I really benefited from that period. But I had no social life. And maybe the bike ride was part of an antidote to, to that and needing to get out and, and find myself uh, uh, again. But for me, I think, and I may have, you know, everybody runs their life their own way, but I've preferred to find the balance in lulls between the different projects and challenges that I've given myself. But when I've got a challenge, I feel that it's like being in training for winning you know, a medal in, in a race, that the, you just have to give it your all. And if there's advice that I was given that, that probably resonated with that and made me more firm in that result was, um, I remember when I was on my bicycle in northern Ghana, so 25 years ago, I met a, a village woman, um, very poor, very tough, um, Sahelian landscape and she was on her own patch of land, um, not her husband's land, she was working at to grow some dry season onions and that, I was visiting her farm and she'd been up before dawn to, to water them because they were looking pretty sick and I, I said to her that you know, was this going to be worth it because she'd taken a loan in order to do this farming and I just, you know, I was looking at these onions and I was hoping that she was actually going to be able to sell them and get something to the market. And her reply to me was that she said, if you're after something, you can't say that you're too tired. And that's probably how I think about things, that if you've got big challenges, that, you know, you can't say that you're too tired, that you really, you, you give it your all and then you rest. And I think you've touched on that work-life balance is a personal uh, perspective. Um, Sarah, can I bring you in and maybe describe what um, you do to try to achieve a work-life balance given your role here at the site? Thanks, Andrew. So I'm going to be quite presumptuous to talk about Jess and my experience here. Um, but before we get to that, there's a quote that I really love. And Jess and I both have young children both of our partners work, so we are dealing, we're in the thick of young, high demand children, um, high demanding partners and jobs. <laughs> and I, I love that quote from Sheryl Sandberg, which is make your partner a real partner. And for me, I think that's a really big part of it. Um, if I could do my own quote, it would be, be deliberately incompetent every now and then to create the space <laughs> for your partner to fill. Um, but I think it's part of um, what the environment that I create, but it's also part of choosing a partner and creating an environment for them to actually be a real partner. Um, Jess and I were both um, lucky enough to be in Canada for two years together, and at that time, both of our partners took a career break. 
Um, they did it differently. My husband worked one day a week remotely for two years, which was an incredible gift. And Jess's husband took some time off, but then also did some FIFO. And for me, I think that is living the values of being able to know when um, someone else can take a lead role on raising children and when someone else can take a lead role. And we're now both back in Australia. Um, both of our partners have been able to re-enter their careers and it has had no material impact. But what we do have is two years of an adventure as families together, two years of our partners having the opportunity to be focused on the family and focused on the children at a really young age. And I think they're both better skiers now as well, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely support that. It's, my husband is a better cook now. <laughs> I did part of the requirements is that he had to go through cookery school in Calgary. Did he have such thing? And so he knows how to cook best now. I cook only half the time, which is great. So it's job share. <laughs> so one of the things that I like to share, actually, because this is down to you know, work-life balance, even linked to flexible work and you know, how we can empower women being International Women's Week. Is when I had my first child in Venezuela, I was young and I started working nearly four weeks after she was born. There was no such thing as maternity leave. I had to use my own earned leave to actually be able to take time off. So ten years later I had my second daughter and I was in the UK at the time and I took six months off. Um, the option was up to a year, but I thought six months is a long time. <laughs> and people didn't understand why I was so amazed. Um, and then uh, when I had my third one, I took nine months off. So it's, and, and I worked part time and, and used all of the resources that were available. So it just to reflect, you know, it's the world you know, is changing and every country in the world is going through a journey. And so Africa, I you know, some people I've talked to, young women that are facing similar challenges, they are still discussing, um, you know, maternity or parental leave um, at this point, let alone flexible working. So how can we actually bring balance? Um, personally, I, am, um, I need to rest in order to recharge because I like to enjoy my work. And I think there's the benefit of working for a corporation like Woodside, that we have the time and the resources to really embark in new business, still deliver the business objectives and growth that we set out to do, but also look after ourselves. It's very important that we look after each other, to be safe, to keep our mental health um, you know, healthy. Um, and it's spent time, and it's a three uh, lesson to the stool. So it's you know exercise, you know look after yourself. It's that time with family to look to feel supported and also just stimulated. The third one is being here and just have fun and come to work engaged every day. Thanks, for that, Jess. And you touched on a very important topic of International Women's Day. Pamela, can I guys ask you one final question? In the book, you reflect on discrimination you experienced as a woman, both in the UK and in Nigeria. Um, in this, the week of International Women's Day, what advice would you provide to young girls, women looking to succeed in business, given all of your experiences? Um, <laughs> um, actually, I, I didn't really experience discrimination in the UK and Nigeria. It, it was in Australia that I experienced discrimination. Um, I, I entered the workforce in the 1980s in, in Melbourne and I wouldn't recommend it to any woman to be a 1980s professional woman in Australia. Arriving in the UK was a breath of fresh air to actually have my ideas listened to. Um, so uh, <laughs> the world has changed, <laughs> thankfully Australia has changed. Um, look, I think I'm, I'm frustrated. I mean, uh, I, I, I think the change should happen much more, much faster. And, and, and although, you know, I'm, I'm getting toward, you know, the back end of my, my career um, trajectory, um, I'm probably more impatient, I think, than some women who, who, you know, accepting the pace of change. 
Um, for me, back in 1987, when I was looking at and thinking, oh, this is going to take to the millennium, that's when I hightailed it off to, off, off to Europe. Uh, and I'm sure there's women who are doing the same. So, uh, you know, not at Woodside, I'm sure, but I, I think there's an element that uh, I'm, I'm a great advocate of quotas. I, I just think that it's disgraceful that we, you know, still don't have 50% uh, um, of women on boards and we don't have the pipeline. I mean, it should be here, it should have been here 20 years ago, not, not, you know, not thinking about it happening by 2030. So, so I'm impatient in that regard. Um, on the other hand, I think the other way the world has changed is that it's opened up so many more opportunities for women. And if I gained anything through my experience, that self-learning and you know particularly I think my bike ride it was life before life after the bike ride and it gave me the space to to know myself and trust myself so instead of a yoga retreat I, I did 18 months on bicycle <laughs> um, and but that was really important that then I could bring myself and so as I said when I came back after that um, I people asked if I'd changed and I couldn't see that I'd changed but Quite quickly, I made different choices. I started choosing different kinds of work, different friends, spending my time in different ways. And I'm sure it was just because I knew better who I was. And people as well were judging me differently because I'd been boxed, you know, oh, she's a strategy consultant, she works all, you know, God hours. And now it's like, oh, she's an adventurer. And, and I could actually bring them together and I was me and I could project me. And, and as a result, I could be more in charge of my destiny and could make more choices regardless of the environment. And I think that's what I like to see for women is that there are more choices now. Um, and you know, it's not just the corporate world. And entrepreneurship has been a huge avenue for women to be able to control their, their time and how they spend their time, which wasn't so common back, back you know, in the 80s. So, um, but, but to be successful in deciding, well, how do I want to create this jigsaw puzzle of, um, you know, how I spend my life and what I want to achieve with it, I think that first and foremost, you've got to, you've got to know yourself. And, and that's what I would be wanting to happen. So on one hand, faster change, um, but on the other hand, you know, women taking control of their destinies and knowing themselves. Mm -hmm.